a little bit different in that it's when multiple fingers touch the screen. So there's, there's a lot to learn here, right? A touch event is when a single finger touches the screen, and then a gesture event is when multiple fingers touch the screen. Okay. Um, take a look at the description there. Similarly, you've got gesture start, gesture change, and then gesture end um, in comparison with touch start, touch end, uh, and the other touch events. Okay. And of course, here they are. Um, you've got touch move and then also touch cancel. Okay. Um, definitely download these slides. Make sure that you take time to review these different things. They, they can and probably will be tested on your HTML5 application development exam. All right, so um, there are also different touch objects that we utilize with uh, touch events, right? A touch object is going to detect input from touch-enabled devices. Um, they're just represent, or sorry, they're, um, they're added to something called a touch list. And a, a touch list is going to, to track all points of contact on a touch screen, right? So if uh, you touch a, a touch screen with a single finger, that entry is going to be added to the touch list. Whereas if you touch something with uh, your index finger and then your middle finger, both of those are going to create two different touch objects, which are then both going to be added to a touch list. Okay, So um, a little confusing, a little difficult to understand at first, but just keep in mind one finger equals one addition to the, uh, the touch list, two fingers equals two additions to the touch list. Okay. All right. Um, and of course, go ahead and take a look at the table on the right of the slide there in order to, to take a look at those different, different properties for touch objects. Um, each touch event also has three different touch lists. So not to make it any more confusing, but you, you don't just have one touch list to keep track of, you have, you have two, or sorry, uh, three, three different touch lists. I'm going to go ahead and circle that for emphasis here. The three different touch lists are, are touches, target touches, and then change touches. Um, touches are just all points currently in contact with the screen. So if you put all five fingers on, that's going to keep track of that. Target touches are going to, to keep track of touch points that are currently in contact with the screen and whose touch start event occurred within the same node, so inside the same target element, right? It's like a button on screen. And then change touches is just a list, a list of uh, touch points that, that cause the current event to be fired. Um, so in a, a touch end event, right, all that you're saying is that, that the finger was removed. So instead of, of uh, dragging across the screen, or rather, uh, if you drag something across the screen, when you lift your finger up, that's your touch end event, right? And so uh, change touches is just going to keep track of changes that have occurred. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look at a quick demo here with touch screens. Uh, take a look at the code on the screen. This is what we're gonna be using for this demo. All that we're gonna do is we're gonna go ahead and create a canvas object and draw a blue square on screen. We've added the event listener. Um, we've got some, some different syntax here that we haven't really talked about too much. These are called control statements in JavaScript. Um, if, so we're saying if there's an on touch start in document dot document element right here in the canvas element, then um, we're going to add an event listener looking for the touch start, and then we're also going to add an event listener looking for a mouse down. So if there's a if touch is active, then we're going to run this first statement. If touch is not active, then we're going to run this second statement. Okay. Um, first, though, we want to make sure that we detect whether or not our screen is a touch screen, right? So um, we've got the detect method here, um, the function, we're taking a look to see if on touch start, right? If when we initialize um, our, our screen. If we're going to run, uh, if we have a touch screen, if it's been detected, then we're going to alert the user that that it's, you know, they have a touch screen device. If there isn't touch, um, then we're going to alert them that there is no touch screen device detected. Okay. So let's go ahead and take a look at that in action. And uh, keep in mind, keep in mind right now that I'm not using a touch screen. So pay attention to what happens. I'm going to go ahead and open up my HTML. 
launch that in the browser from Web Matrix. And so I'm going to click the box to start touch screen detection. All I do is I click it and no touch screen device was detected. So if I was on a tablet, um, it would definitely say that a touch screen device was detected. Okay, all right. Let's go back to the presentation here real fast. HTML5 APIs, right? Really important to know this stuff for an exam. Let's go ahead and jump right in. Let's not waste any more time, okay? Um, First, before we talk about the APIs themselves, let's talk about the organization that's responsible for them. Um, the Web Hypertext Application Technology Working Group was formed by Apple and the Mozilla Foundation, um, the creators of the Firefox browser, and then Opera Software, who created this, the Opera browser as well. Um, they defined their own specification for HTML5. Um, this organization, different from W3C, who we, we've referenced throughout this, this presentation and out um, throughout our entire, uh, our entire course, right? Um, the the WHATWG HTML5 specification includes these, these four APIs that we're just about to talk about with geolocation, web workers, web sockets, and then also file. So, all right, uh, the geolocation API. You use this API and its source code to access geographical coordinates of a user's device. And when I say geographical coordinates, we're talking about latitude and longitude. Um, there are two primary functions that you would use within this API, right? You've got get per current position, which is going to say, hey, this is where this device is located. And then watch position, which is going to take a look at, at how or where that device is moving. So if I'm located here, and then all of a sudden, I change my location. The watch position is going to be responsible for monitoring where I'm at at any given point in time. Okay? Commonly used, something that you're probably very familiar with. Um, and of course, there's no code in this particular example. If you take a look at the slide again, um, that's going to show you how to display this on a map. But this is the information that's used with Bing Maps in order to be able to, to find out where something's located in order to visualize where something is located. All right, so let's go ahead and just show a quick demo again. So I'm gonna pop this open. Notice that I just went ahead and embedded my script inside of my HTML file this time for, for ease. I've got uh, two different input boxes, right? I've got latitude and longitude. I'm gonna click this button and I'm gonna utilize our, our two methods that we just talked about in order to get the latitude and longitude and let's see what happens. So notice localhost wants to track my physical location, right? So my browser wants to track location. I'm going to say allow once, and there it is, right? My latitude and longitude. It's pretty cool stuff. Pretty cool stuff that you can do with these APIs. So I'm going to close out of Internet Explorer and head back to the presentation. And let's talk about web workers. Um, take a look at the graphic on the right. It's not these guys, okay? It's not what web workers are. Uh, Web Workers is an API, and, and what this API does is it runs JavaScript scripts in the background. Okay, so s let's say that that um, let's say that you have have uh, you're you're on your browser. A browser traditionally can only run one script at a time. Sometimes you need background services to run in order to obtain information. So maybe you've got like a stock ticker or you've got something along those lines, right? Um, that, that needs to update uh, you know, every second, every moment that you're on a browser. And, and we're going to utilize web workers for that. All right, so let's go back to the presentation here. Um, web workers just pass information through messages. And they, they run separately from that main HTML document in something called a thread, right? So browsers traditionally only run one thread. Web workers allow them to run two threads, right? So they can, they can uh, run two scripts or execute two scripts at the same time. All right, next, let's talk about the, the WebSocket API. Um, WebSocket API is great because it increases efficiency of data flow between a browser, uh, you know, your client machine, and, and a web server, right? Uh, it creates a simultaneous two-way connection, and, and that simply allows data to flow back and forth pretty freely, not entirely freely, so keep that in mind. Um, WebSockets also used for real-time applications like chat, um, online games, and also you know, sports scores. There are three primary events you guys should be aware of. Um, you got 
on open, so when a socket opens, on message, when a message is received from a web server, um, including some kind of HTML, right? We talked about that earlier. WebSocket's a little bit different from HTTP, which is traditionally used. Um, and then also we have the on close event there as well. And finally, the file API, it allows web applications to upload files from local storage to remote servers. Um, file API, it features several different interfaces for accessing files. So you've got file, file list, um, blob, and then file reader. Uh, file just is for one, uploading one file or it reads in one file as a URL. File list is going to allow you to upload a list of files or multiple files. Blob provides access to, to raw binary data. And of course, File Reader provides a, a way for, for users to go ahead and read and display a file on screen. So. All right. Um, let's finish up here with accessing device and system resources. Um, we talked about the web storage API at length already. Um, it just allows you to store data in the browser um, locally versus on a web server. There are two different types. There's local and then there's session storage. Local storage, no limit to how long um, the data persists, right? You can save a ton of different user information um, on a, a local machine, and it's going to stay there for as long as you want. Session, session storage, on the other hand, is going to save session data. So from when a, a user starts using the application, it's going to pull that data, and it's going to save it locally for the duration of the session, right? Um, both objects allow users to store large amounts of data, and there's no slowdown in a connection because data isn't transferred back and forth from a web server, it's kept locally. Um, we haven't talked yet about how to implement web storage, and, and in order to implement it, you want to use the local storage and session storage objects with these methods down here. Whoops, my bad there with these methods down here um, in the table to manage key value pairs. And so a key is something as simple as maybe you have first name. And then a pair, since my name's Cullen, I'll go ahead and write my name here. A pair, or sorry, when I say that, a value would be Cullen. Okay, so I've got the key, which is essentially a variable name, first name, right? And then the value that you would store in that variable, which would be Cullen, my first name. Let's talk about how to implement these methods here real quickly. Um, for a session storage object, note that we go ahead and we make reference to the object. We're going to use the set item method. Um, where it says key, we would enter something like name. And then for value, we would enter that value that we were talking about. And if you wanted to go ahead and access that item, right, you would just go ahead and use get item key, and then you can store it in a variable here on the, the left there, my var. Um, similarly, with local storage, you perform the same exact functions, um, set item, and also get item with the key. And that's going to allow you to go ahead and, and uh, set that data and then also get that data later. Okay. All right. Um, finally, accessing hardware. When you build HTML5, CSS, and JavaScript apps, um, you know, they're device independent, which means that they can work on any platform, any device, anywhere, right? A smartphone, a tablet, a computer. Um, these device independent apps, you know, we build them to be able to access hardware capabilities such as your GPS system, an accelerometer, which is going to uh, sense motion if you're using a phone, right? And smartphones all have accelerometers, and also the camera. And so you don't necessarily need to know how to implement these things for, for the HTML5 application development fundamentals exam, but you should be aware of the fact that if you build an app, it can access hardware. And that kind of goes back to what we talked about in module one uh, with the Windows runtime environment and how to make that possible. So keep that in mind. This has been a, a wonderful, wonderful time uh, getting to know you. I'm just joking. We didn't get to know each other. But you did learn a lot of wonderful content, okay? 
Let's do a quick recap now. Um, we went ahead and, and we covered objective 4.5, respond to the touch interface.